Hello and welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. Once again, in studio, I'm your host, Chris Collins, back again for another conversation with 1st Franklin District State Rep Steve Kulik. Lots to talk about before we get to the representative. Uh, just a quick note of congratulations to all of our new graduates out there. Of course, uh, it's a very special time. Frontier graduated recently to all the other high schools around the area, and, uh, and now the real fun begins for you graduates. But uh, this is my 30th year. I can't believe it. This is my 30th year uh, since my high school graduation, and, uh, and I still think about those days very fondly, and you will as well. Um, and good luck to all of our graduating seniors as they move on to whatever life has in store for them moving forward. We have a couple of good kids here that work for us, uh, uh, Marina Corpita and Ben Talona, who are graduating this year from Frontier. Special congratulations to them. They're very good kids and, and very talented, and uh, as is the entire class of 2016 from Frontier and all of our Franklin County communities. Having said that, we're going to talk about a bunch of issues today with Steve Kulik and, of course, the big one, Steve, as we know, and welcome back to the show again. Appreciate you having the, the time to come in. Uh, the pipeline appears now to really be dead. Now, the, the, the proposal was withdrawn by Kinder Morgan. They told the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission it's not going to happen. So this is something that I think we expected to happen, but the formality of them withdrawing is especially exciting for pipeline opponents, I would think. That's right. Well, thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me back. And uh, let me also add my congratulations to all the Frontier graduates this year and, and wish them all the best in whatever their endeavors may be. You know, this whole battle over the last two plus years over the pipeline is really about the future. And it's really those graduates, um, what kind of uh, environment they're going to be living in, in in the future as they go out and work and raise families or whatever they do. And so this final word uh, from Kinder Morgan that they have withdrawn their application from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for this pipeline, I think is very good news for the quality of life in Franklin County, uh, for moving forward with, with a more progressive and green energy future. And I just can't say enough about the uh, very positive and well-informed and, and intense uh, sustained action by local officials, uh, by the select boards in our region, um, by energy committees, and by thousands of citizens who very early in this process, back in the winter of 2014, when the project was announced, um, really buckled down, learned everything they could about the, the negative impacts versus what the potential uh, positive impacts might be of a gas pipeline. Um, I think most people found on balance the negatives outweigh the positives in that we would have environmental degradation, uh, particularly on, on conservation land, on state and private uh, conservation lands that are supposed to be protected in perpetuity. We had public health and safety issues um, with pipelines. We just saw a major explosion yeah. of a pipeline right. just like this. I think it was in Pennsylvania a couple of weeks ago. Um, we had the issues of uh, small towns who have uh, limited resources when it comes to emergency response, ma mainly volunteers and most of them, having to respond to potential accidents with this pipeline. So re reducing property values, you name it. Um, and so I think people in this area very quickly came to the conclusion that there was nothing good to be gained by having this pipeline constructed and moved through Franklin County. And in a larger sense, for our, our planet's energy future and our Commonwealth's goals for climate change um, and clean air. And we, we passed a bill in 2008, the Global Warming Solutions Act, which set out very strict goals for us to reach in terms of um, uh, our environment and clean air in 2020 and beyond. And we're just not going to be able to reach those goals if we increase our reliance on fossil fuels such as natural gas. So. Um, this is a, something we're celebrating, it, but it's also, I think, a challenge to us um, to now uh, replace the energy that we're losing out of our grid by the closure of the coal plants, the closure of several nuclear plants, and replace that energy with several things. Um, more efficient use of what we have, so investments in energy efficiency and conservation more reliance on green technologies, um, solar, and we did a raise the solar caps and address the net metering issue this spring. We're going to have to do more of that right. because solar is so popular and it is such a significant part of our energy mix. It can be much, much more than it is. But we're just about to do an energy bill in the House uh, that will 
um, look at generation uh, of, of new electricity via importations of hydro generated electricity from Canada and also by really investing and supporting the development of an offshore wind uh, energy um, industry, if you will. But that's always been very controversial, especially when you talk about Nantucket Sound and those areas. Yeah, yeah. So this is different than that. We, we know about the Cape Wind project, which has had its ups and downs, is currently in the down phase. Yeah. It probably will never be built. Um, and so we're not even talking about that, Nantucket Sound, uh, Cape Wind. We're talking about uh, much further offshore deep water um, oh. um, generation uh, in federally leased waters. Um, and the federal government has set aside thousands of square miles for this development. And there are a number of European energy companies. Uh, Europe has really taken to offshore wind in a big way. And um, so we're looking at, at that as not only providing a lot of electricity for Massachusetts, but uh, a burgeoning industry in terms of the construction, uh, the development of technologies. We're one of the few states that actually has a, um, through our clean energy center, a wind turbine testing facility, um, which uh, people can test different types of blade technologies to make it more efficient. So uh, we stand, I think, to be a national leader um, by doing business with uh, primarily um, the Dutch and German companies that are mm. very advanced in uh, wind energy over in Europe. Um, to, we can be a national leader, um, certainly along the eastern seaboard. And they're also talking about them in the Gulf of Maine. And some of the projects that talk about providing electricity to Massachusetts combine uh, hydro and offshore wind and transmitting it into Massachusetts. So, you know, having a mix is important because hydro provides sort of baseline 24-7 uh, energy. Wind turbines don't run all the time. Uh, right. Sometimes they go down for maintenance, or if there's no wind, they're not really generating. So they are in a much better position to supplement our energy um, on a regular basis. They, they may generate 30% to 50% of the time. So it's important to look at those as well as solar, and I can't stress enough uh, efficiency and investment in conservation. Now when you talk about offshore, I mean, how far off, are we talking about middle of the middle of the Atlantic? Uh, or? We're, we're talking um, several dozen miles offshore, off the coast of the Cape and, and uh, the south so coast of Massachusetts. So beyond the Cape, I would think that would impact yeah. some fishing areas, wouldn't it? Well, it's areas that have been set aside by the federal government, so you can fish in these areas as well. Um, you know, these are 250 to 300 feet tall, um, uh -huh. and so you can do uh, commercial fishing and so forth in and amongst uh, these types of facilities. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that's the first I've heard that there was something beyond Cape Wind. All I, all I know is that when Cape Wind got proposed, everybody lost their minds and oh yeah. my God, it's going to destroy the the, uh, the tourism in the Cape and ruin people's views. And but you know, it seems like it makes a lot of sense. I think the only concern you might have would be during hurricane season. Right. <laughs> right. So I think the, the Cape Wind is not entirely dead, but it's not really being considered in this bill that we're going to be doing in the legislature in June. Interesting. So in terms of the pipeline, I know that. You're relieved from from a standpoint of, of the potential destruction of very pristine farmland and that kind of thing. But from a political standpoint, aren't you a little relieved that this is finally off the table? I mean, you were pretty you've been consistent from the beginning in your opposition to this. Not everybody in the delegation has, but I, I would think you'd be glad to have this go away. Well, I am, and I have to say, I was a bit surprised because I figured that we would go through this FERC proposal that the, this would drag on for years. Um, you know, FERC at the federal level really does have the ultimate yeah. control over licensing an interstate pipeline project like this. Um, but there were so many unique issues uh, in Massachusetts, such as the Article 97 constitutional protection which for is conservation, still in the wind, though, right? which is still um, uh, an issue being litigated in uh, southern Berkshire County, uh, which is sort of a test case for the sanctity of Article 97 versus the authority of FERC. So, still very much in play. Um, but I thought this would go on for quite a long time. But I also have said from the beginning that if this project were to end, it would end because of a combination of the citizen opposition and it would not make financial sense for the company. And that is what the corporations like Kinder Morgan really pay attention to is that bottom line. And what they determined was they couldn't make money off of this for their investors to sink 
you know, several billion dollars into it because they didn't have the customers. I think because of concerns about um, the environmental and public safety aspects and the opposition, many of the local gas companies that Kinder Morgan was depending on to be customers of this gas coming into Massachusetts and, and northern New England as well, they didn't come forward. I think those gas companies are looking at other alternatives. Um, some of them do have other alternatives. Um, you know, Berkshire Gas really doesn't. Berkshire Gas really put all its eggs in the basket of Kinder Morgan. And now that that project's gone, they're kind of sitting in a difficult place in how to meet the demand in their service territory. Well, I want to talk about that because the moratorium is still in effect. Even though the project is dead, Berkshire and Columbia are not taking any new hookups. And they continue to maintain that they can't without new capacity. So the last time we talked, you had said you were, there were ways the legislature could compel them to change their minds. Anything new on that front? Well, Stan Rosenberg and I have been working uh, very diligently on this. We've been talking regularly with Berkshire Gas, uh, particularly in the month uh, since the pipeline was suspended and now canceled within the last few days. Um, so we're talking with Berkshire Gas and we're, we're trying to nudge them into uh, moving to a plan B, if you will, uh, a, an alternative scenario. And I have to say, I'm disappointed that Berkshire Gas, while it wholeheartedly embraced and was relying on Kinder Morgan's get pipeline, they, sh they didn't have any backup plan. And to me, that's a real letdown to the customers uh, that they have in this region. It's the eastern region of their service territory that's impacted here in Franklin County. It's Greenfield, it's Montague, it's Deerfield, it's Sunderland, it's Waitley, and then it's also Hadley and Amherst, so um, the University of Massachusetts. So they had no alternative um, for if Kinder Morgan were to fail. So now Kinder Morgan has failed and they're playing catch up. Um, there are things that they can do in the short term and they need to begin looking at the long term. For example, um, they have an LNG facility in Waitley. Um, that is permitted to be larger than it is and it would make sense to continue going through the process to try to expand the options there uh, so that, that that can supplement uh, what they bring through in, in um, their, their normal natural gas supply. Um, they can make investments in improving their distribution lines within Franklin County. Um, they can look at um, other kinds of arrangements, perhaps with Columbia Gas, with uh, the Northampton lateral that comes up through Northampton, perhaps supplementing what Berkshire Gas is able to get uh, in terms of natural gas. And uh, conservation. Um, I'm not convinced that Berkshire Gas has done everything it can to help its customers, its current customers, use gas in the most efficient way that they can. Um, that's both in manufacturing uh, processes, in home heating, um, and um, in terms of conservation in general. Um, they can do more, and if they do more, and if they also you know, do a very aggressive, I know they've done a lot to plug leaks, but yeah. they can do more. Um, and so if they do those things, they will free up supply. And, and I recently had a meeting in my office in Boston with the Attorney General, Maura Healy, and her staff about this issue. And um, she pointed out that when the De Department of Public Utilities approved the merger settlement agreement for Berkshire Gas's parent com company, Ibadrola, which is a Spanish company, the, the Attorney General fought for and had included in that agreement a million dollars to serve um, uh, low-income people, businesses, uh, and improve conservation and gas efficiency in the eastern region, basically in the area affected by the moratorium. So what I've put on the table with Berkshire Gas, and we're going to be discussing with the Attorney General and the DPU, is getting that million dollars. It's to be spent over five years, but it, it can be used to convert current gas customers to, say, high-efficiency wood pellet boilers. Hmm. or to heat pumps. Isn't that funny because Berkshire spent all that money and time trying to convince people to switch over to gas. Yeah. And, how, and now they have to go in the other direction. Now basically. they have to go in the other direction. But I think that's being a responsible company with a, a fuel that um, is not, you know, finite in its, in its uh, um, supply over, over many decades going forward. So conserving it now is, and doing it as, using it as much efficiently as you can 
is the answer for keeping them in business and their customers satisfied. And it does have a negative impact on our economy if people can't get gas. If we want businesses to move to our region, we have industrial parks in Waitley and Deerfield, and we have, um, you know, I think a very attractive area for businesses to come where you have a lot of higher education, a skilled workforce, a great quality of life. Um, if, but, it, but things do take energy. Uh, and oh, yeah. so energy is an important part of any business making a decision to locate here or to expand here. So we're trying to move Berkshire Gas. I think we're having some positive conversations with them. I think they now see the immediacy. They're over the shock of losing Kinder Morgan. And now it's time to really put your nose to the grindstone and, and come up with some solutions for both the short and long term. I think we're going to get there. Um, I'm hoping that they can be able to uh, lift the moratorium as soon as possible and give people some more certainty about their energy future. I'm not an expert on the gas issue, but it, it seems to me that to expect a company like that to conserve its way to new capacity, I'm not sure how realistic that is. Wouldn't they have done that already now, maybe by now, if they could have? They have invested in, in efficiency, um, but I think they can do more. That's the, that's the issue, and that's the issue with all energy companies. It's not, energy companies aren't like they used to be. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, I recently met with some um, automobile manufacturers uh, about um, green cars, uh, about whether electric or hybrid, uh, but particularly we're talking about all electric cars. You know, this is uh, an agreement that they've all made um, to, uh, if they're going to continue, it's part of their agreements relative to the CAFE standards, the, the uh, if fuel efficiency standards. If they're going to keep manufacturing cars that burn gasoline and contribute to climate change and air pollution, that they're now obligated to make cars that are all electric and have zero emissions. They lose money on every single one of them. Exactly. But it's a cost of doing business, and it's one that they readily accept. At least that's what they, they say to me. And there's some awfully good deals out there for people who want to buy electric vehicles. But, um, you know, it, the, the, the public perception of energy and the way businesses that are in the energy field operate has changed a lot in the last really just five years. They and have it's going to change even more. And what I see is that this next generation coming up, these kids who are graduating from Frontier this year and in the next few years, younger people have a very different view of energy consumption and the planet and the environment um, than many older people do. And uh, they, it, it matters to them that um, we do something serious about climate change. Uh, that we do something to make a more sustainable and green economy that doesn't use the natural resources of the earth in the ways we have in the past. That gives me hope for the future, and businesses have to follow along if they still want those people to be customers in 20 years. The younger generation also has very different views on a lot of social issues, which we'll talk about in the next topic, because, you know, even 25 years ago, when you started in, in uh, state politics, the idea of debating a transgender rights bill was unheard of. But then again, back then, the idea of gay marriage was unheard of. There are a lot right. of things that I think the younger generation sort of don't view as major issues that were major fights. Mm -hmm. And now we're at a point where the House is about to debate the transgender rights bill that the Senate recently passed. And it was recently reported out of your committee, and there was some controversy because four members of your Ways and Means Committee voted against it. And there are some people that want to know those names. I know your name isn't on that list as voting against, you voted against, you right. voted in favor of it. Um, but what do you make about that flap, flap? And does it matter if four members voted against the idea? You know, it really doesn't. Um, uh, people vote their conscience. They vote the way they feel their district might want them to vote. A lot of things go into the decision about how you're going to vote on any issue as a legislator. And um, these votes, when we're you know, releasing a bill from committee, the votes are done electronically. Uh, the bill is sent out to the members by email. We get to read it. We get to study it. Uh, and then you mean we, you actually got to read the bill? Unlike uh, the federal health care bill, you got to read this we one. We got to read it. That's great. And so, um, so then you, you vote, or you can abstain if you wish, but you vote, yes, I, I vote to release it from committee, or I don't vote to release it from, I'm vote, voting against it. And I don't really care. Um, who's voting for it or against it. Um, I voted for it, I was happy to do it, happy to tell people how I voted on any vote uh, in committee. Um, but committee rules for a very long time have kept the individual results. Uh, they give you the aggregate result, but the individual how somebody voted 
unless they want to reveal it, and I think most are fine with revealing it, um, the, the committee doesn't put it out. Uh, now, I spoke to another member of the press who was asking about this, and, and I said, look, you know, it, it is a long-standing practice in the legislature. Each committee has its own rules. Some committees, you know, act differently and release the, the roll call, so to speak. Um, but it's, it's certainly a topic for conversation when we, you know, sit down as a new legislature and review the rules of each committee and the House and Senate as a whole. Um, you know, if, if members would like those to be public, then we can make them public. Uh, but it's not really that big a flap. Um, you know, as I've said, I, I always assume that uh, any vote I take, whether it's behind closed doors in a committee or on an online poll, it's, it's public information, should be public information. I'm happy to share it. I know that the transgender rights bill uh, is something that's, it's depending on what state you're in. I mean, in North Carolina, it's a huge thing. There's, it's still fighting. There's lawsuits being filed. But in Massachusetts, it doesn't seem like it has the same stigma for some reason. Now, we're a progressive state, obviously. Uh, it sounds like the House is going to pass this thing. What about this bill should people be aware of? What are the, what are the key points in it? So a few years ago, I think it was uh, about five years ago, we did pass um, some expansion of rights for transgender genders in discrimination in housing, in employment, things that we take for granted for most people. So that, you know, if you're a transgender person and you apply for a job, you know, in a school district or in a coffee shop or a mechanics shop or whatever, you cannot be discriminated against because of your sexual and gender identity. So. Um, what we did not do at that time was carry it to the next step, and that's what's on the table right now, which is bringing the anti-discrimination provisions into public accommodations. And now, I, I remember when yeah. Stan Rosenberg was on, he talked about how under the current law, you can work as a transgender person for a restaurant. If, at, when your shift is over, if you go out in the dining room and someone complains that you're there, a customer, your boss can kick you out. <laughs> Which seems bizarre. Yeah, it is bizarre, and that's one of the things we hope to fix. Um, and, um, you know, some people say, you know, society's changing too, too fast and going too far. Um, you know, in my view, discrimination against anyone is, is, should be off the table. Um, you know, this is America, um, and um, people should be able to, you know, live their lives as they uh, see fit. And so, uh, transgender uh, issues have become far more in the in the forefront. I think, you know, it's not dissimilar to when we did same-sex marriage right. uh, ten or now almost twelve years ago. I think, um, you know, it was it was really on the cutting edge. I mean, it was a and we were the first uh, state uh, to legalize same-sex marriage uh, through an act of legislation, not through the courts. And I think we should be very proud of that. Um, and I think we're also, we're, we're not leading the country on this issue of transgender rights that we're about to take up in the House this week, because about half the states, I think, or a third of the other states, have provisions like this already. And so we're joining some other folks. And then, of, of course, some very controversial actions in like North Carolina yeah. and Texas and some other states. But, you know, I, I think that, um, those who, there are people who oppose it, and they, I understand their opposition. Um, I understand it's very often uh, you know, founded in their moral or religious beliefs, um, and I, I respect that. I, I really do. Um, but I also think people are being a little bit unrealistic when they're f fearful that um, you know, sexual predators, they turn it into that sort of an issue. Yeah that sexual predators masquerading as transgender people are going to go into opposite sex bathrooms and um, you know, abuse, harass, uh, particularly young children. Um, you know, that's illegal today. Uh, so We already have a law for we that. Always have, we always have a law, we have many laws against that sort of behavior. Uh, those are criminal acts, they will continue to be criminal acts. Uh, what this is really about is about letting people live their lives um, fully, including the most personal types of activities, like using a restroom, um, in order to um, identify with their own sexual identity. But if you recall, when the dis debate over gay marriage was happening, one of the things everybody kept saying was, well, well not everybody, but the opponents kept saying, was, well, if, if, you, if you make marriage anything other than a man and a woman, then people will be marrying their dogs and right. their cats and their, their house plants or whatever. And I, did, I don't see a lot of, you know, 
human and dog marriages happening. No. <laughs> I know you're very fond of Jack. <laughs> I love Jack. But, but, uh, but you're married there too. There are boundaries. <laughs> yeah, no. Right. I wouldn't want to be a big Yeah, Barb, is, Bar- Barb would not like you to be married to Jack. Yeah, Barb would probably have Jack around than me most of the time, but that's a whole separate <laughs> issue. But no, a lot of, you know, the sky didn't fall. No. Um, society didn't change fundamentally in a way that, uh, you know, has, has made people re- really uncomfortable. Um, I mean, we now have sitcoms on network television about... Right. Um, you know, people that like we encounter in everyday life, in our family, and our friends, and coworkers. So, um, I think this is just another step along the road to ending discrimination against a particular class of people. Um, and I think it's important to do. I'm glad the Senate has already done it. I think it will pass the House, and I'm optimistic that Governor Baker will sign it. He hasn't indicated for sure whether he will or not, but various statements he's said in the last few weeks lead me to believe that um, you know, he, he's comfortable with it. He's a socially progressive person. Um, he's fiscally conservative, but he seems very socially open-minded, and uh, we'll see what happens. But I think the time has come for Massachusetts to take this step, and it's appropriate right now. And, and like you said, the next generation doesn't care. Well, obviously, they don't care, but it's certainly not a deal-breaker issue you know, uh, as it is for some of the older people. I yeah, think. yeah. I think you know, younger people, they just scratch their heads and say, why is this a big deal to you guys? I mean, uh, they don't understand. You know? And uh, that's certainly been my experience um, uh, with, with same-sex marriage is um, I run into people who are in their teens, and you, know, this, this, you couldn't do this before? This was illegal? Really? Yeah. You know. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and it's, it, it's sort of like, you know, I was watching a movie the other night called All the Way, where Brian Cranston played Lyndon Johnson. Yes, and, that was great. Was I watched it as well. It was a great film. Phenomenal. And a uh, tremendous performance. But it was about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And, and today, you know, even though race relations are still in the news, you look back on that and what was the big deal? I mean, yeah. And, and, and I think even to my generation today, and I wasn't alive in 64, but... I watched that thinking, I can't believe some of the things they were saying on the House floor. About, oh, yeah. And, and today we're debating transgender rights. So I think we have come a long way in this we, society. We have. We definitely have. And we have lots more to talk about, but we can't get to it in this edition. So we're going to have to have to come back. That's great. And, and everyone should see that movie on HBO, oh, by the way. All Brian Cranston stuff. is amazing. I've watched it three times. You know, and, the, it, and I just... I'm floored by it. He's so good. Those, you know, those years that Johnson was president were sort of my formative years as a political junkie, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, civil rights, um, anti-war movement, all that stuff. And uh, he's he's amazing. He really makes you believe he's LBJ. He does. And and people even that were on the set that were in the production said they weren't dealing with Brian Cranston. They were dealing with Johnson. And yeah. Sometimes he scared them. Yeah. That's how you know it's a great role. But definitely check it out on HBO. Yep. The, the movie's called All the Way. And. If you like the politics of the 60s, you're going to want to watch that. There's a little plug there on public access. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have you come back. We have a lot of other stuff we have to get to, but I appreciate okay. you making time to talk about these very important issues. Absolutely. My guest has been Steve Kulik from the 1st Franklin District. That's Beacon Hill Update. Be sure and join us for part two of our conversation coming up very soon. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.